Hello. This particular topic or subject in aircraft aviation history is of extremely fundamental nature. It doesn't matter whether in objective examination the weightage of this topic is high or low and the complexity is gone up to a high level or a moderate level but the entire topic of aircraft flight mechanics is of extremely crucial nature simply because it teaches you how to fly things. If we see the disciplines right, of the entire aviation, you have this aircraft with these wings, the tail, the vertical tail, the nozzle, the beautiful engine. Your propulsion talks about this part, where on on the wing, the propulsion engines, the turbofan props, are driving the aircraft forward. The structure talks about this, the body, right? Aerodynamics talks about the physics of the flow of fluid over this entire aircraft as you fly, right? The three disciplines. If you make this as a spacecraft, a rocket, which is going up, it talks about space flight mechanics. You have a discipline of something called as controls because you have these surfaces which change, right? So if this is the section of the wing as seen from the top, this surface can deflect top down and there is this big hydraulic pin jacket line controlled by the electric maneuver. And inside if you see the dashboard, you have this big joystick, you have these two controls. So this is a topic of aircraft control but all of these play around how things fly how things are stabilized how things are moved in an air and that's the flight mechanics it talks about aircraft as an object and its disciplines of motion as it flies and creates different maneuvers it takes into account all the information fed by these three disciplines which are more of a science and it acts like technology to pull them together and feeds back something again to these three units or the control as a fourth unit to do the necessary control achievements. So flight mechanics typically will have four parts. One is basics of atmosphere and where things fly and how the altitudes and things are combined. Second is equations of motion, simply aircraft motion. Here you look at the aircraft as an object, as a body and actually apply now the full set of equations of motion, the Newtonian set of equations of motion to understand how it flies and here these other knowledges are very important. Here the performance as we call it comes into mind. Will the aircraft that I have designed fly 1000 kilometers before it exhausts its entire fuel or will it go up to 20 kilometers, 10 kilometers up in the air? Will it be able to fly 1 meter just top of the sea surface? All of these questions of performance are answered here. Extremely important point. Then we talk about stability. Which means to ensure that everything that we want it to happen what are the set of equations and the, the control surfaces as we call need to be there. The control plus propulsion plus aerodynamics plus structures, all four put together. To stabilize an aircraft in a given frame of motion. You have, if you have seen some good, good movies, say for example the La One Sky, which is a French movie, which has actually F-16 fantastic maneuvers it is doing with Mirage. You see at one point of time aircraft engine catches fire and starts falling like a dead object. So, that time this is a question mark. Which means the stability is something or if even if a normal cruise aircraft is flying, the normal Boeing 737 is flying and you want to now bring it down. It is not as simple as bringing it out by saying oh bring it down. No, it's not that simple. Stability teaches you how these maneuvers are performed and how the aircraft is stabilized for those maneuvers.
So stability is extremely important. And then the fourth is controls and motion. This talks about as an aircraft as a whole, what are the different sets of contour controls that are applied and how that are used to carry out set of maneuvers. If somebody tells you a 60 minute, 60 degree, a 60 second full turn, what does that mean? How do the control surfaces are deployed? If somebody says that the aircraft is undergoing fugoidal motion, it looks alien today, right? But there is a motion, fugoidal motion, roughly this, which is understood here. A spin motion, what does a spin mean? When the aircraft goes into a spin, it's a disaster, what does that mean? That's the fourth part. So this entire topic series on aircraft stability and the flight mechanics is going to focus on these four. This is the simplest. This is nice and very beautiful basic mathematics. This is involved and this is very very involved. From any competitive exam point of view, aircraft undergraduate needs to know these four points. Very very important. Right? So this is about aircraft aircraft stability and flight mechanics in a nutshell as to what are the first principal disciplines. Right? This is by the way a beautiful depiction of how the four things come together and start interacting with each other and this is the only subject where multidisciplinary science of propulsion, aerodynamics, structures is going to come together as a technology. Aircraft performance. Right? So it's a technology. So let us look at some of the basic very very basic uh, terminologies which we should be clear from a competitive point of view when it's a global taxonomy so we should use the same taxonomy one is range we will look at all of these right endurance this is not a spaceship please keep in mind if you are a science fiction geek or if you are Christopher Nolan's ardent follower endurance is not from that. No. Endurance is a scientific term. Okay? So, forget Christopher Nolan. Don't get your heads too much dragged into space and seeing suddenly that, oh, endurance, endurance spaceship, analyze the motion. It's the spin of endurance. Towers, Mars, no. Come back. It's aircraft. Rate of climb. And then, Standard atmosphere. Okay? So, what is range? As we commonly understand it very simply, the range as an English word means a range of something. How much from it go from point A to point B under certain constraints? And that's exactly the meaning in the aircraft taxonomy as well. The range of the aircraft is defined simply as a total distance traversed by an aircraft with single load of fuel that is given full tank of fuel this is my aircraft loaded fully on the ground do whatever you want with how much tonnage whatever it can carry the simple test it it has to fly it has to take off it has to come back so based on this constraint of it being able to create the aircraft airborne mission maneuver if i load it with full amount of fuel that it can take you can keep everything as a fuel, it's your choice. There will be some empty weight as we have seen, right? So, typically aircraft would have something as empty weight. Right? This is purely the weight of the basic structures, which you cannot do away with, otherwise there is nothing. Right? You can take out entire internals, the deck and everything in the Boeing 737, that is not required, it is not a part of probably empty weight. You can actually take out everything, there may be an empty fuselage inside. But there has to be some fuselage. The wing, except fuel, everything is empty. An engine, only essential nut bolts. Everything, just bare minimum to make aircraft fly. That's empty weight. And then fuel weight. How much maximum you can load it with the fuel? Right? And then the payload. There may be certain basic payload or there may not be anything. But with this weight, assuming that the payload is gone, you take and take off with the aircraft and you go up till the point where the fuel exhausts. Theoretically, you are I mean, theoretically crashing it. You have to take into account practically the landing, but theoretically if you are crashing, that's the reach. So say for example, it may be called as Airbus A380, 
has a range of about with this maximum fuel weight and the empty weight combination of 12 to 14,000 kilometers. So 14,000 kilometers is given. Does that mean you will always fall out? No, it's a maximum. But that's a good ballpark to know. If the range itself given is 1,200 kilometers and you want to fly transatlantic, you are daydreaming. Not possible, right? But if range is 10,000 kilometers, okay, feasible. Flying a long haul non-stop 12 hours flight, possible. So that's the importance of this. Right? Then there is something called ferry range, then there is something called as truncated range and so on, full payload range. We will go into this in chapter 3. But for now, range is point A to point B distance. Right? Now, if this is the case, then there is something called as Y single shot fuel. You may be aware that military aircrafts most of the time have in the air, mid-air refueling capacity. They have that ability of mid-air refueling. So, aircraft as it starts emptying the tank, a further oil tanker comes nearby, an extremely critical step of which is extremely complex in nature of docking happens which is by the way one of the nightmares of all the aircraft stability people right so this is one aircraft this is this forward receiving end and this is this big tanker aircraft which has this loading end to happen the docking not just these two velocities need to match correctly these and these other two dimensional noises of motion need to be extremely carefully continuously adjusted so this involves controls plus our flight mechanic boots because based on that only this extremely complex docking maneuver happens right so you can transfer a fuel mid-air and then suddenly the aircraft gets further boosted it can go up till any point right theoretically with mid-air refueling you can have infinite range because as you reach approach emptiness, you fill it. As you approach emptiness, fill it. On the ground, you actually take your car to nearest fuel station. This is that flying fuel station, nothing else. So from range, it is not a realistic picture because you, you, this is an exceptional scenario, not always the scenario. So that's my single shot, which means there is no refueling which is happening. Endurance. Total time it is to do with time. What is your endurance? The question, right? that it can stay in the air with again single shot or single load fuel I become airborne with the amount of fuel that I have I do whatever now here the constraint is very different time for range you may fly faster you may decide right you have this choice now either you can fly very very fast in cruise to ensure maximum range is covered right rabbit and tortoise the hare and tortoise uh, basically the, the dilemma right should I run faster or should I continuously keep slow running and doesn't matter. For aircraft, range is point A to point B, I don't care how you fly. Endurance, the time, I don't care how slow you fly. So for endurance, you may actually think of saying, oh, my aircraft will fly only at constant, very, very small velocity of its cruise velocity to maximize endurance and possible, right? This gives rise to something called as loiter. Just hanging around, maneuvering. This typically happens when you when you hear for the very very busy aircrafts, very very busy airports like Mumbai, that we are in congestion and we are hovering around and just give us a hold by in the air, right? You are loitering, you are just waiting for the clearance to come and then you land. So that loitering is something but related to endurance. So in endurance, the moment you become airborne, you would try to maximize that time in air. And this is very very important for reconciliation missions. Rescue missions, photography of these surveillance missions. In surveillance missions, your objective is to remain airborne for as much time as possible in at a given altitude or a required altitude to capture as many photographs or to navigate and to actually scan a given area in the rescue, right? Rescue also the objective is not quickly to reach to that guy, but most importantly for us to locate. If, if you are actually in the mid sea miles and thousands of miles away you have to find some small floating object you have to have a very high endurance most of the drones are designed to sustain high endurance with higher endurance range may be truncated or they may be also be high but speed may generally take a toll right so that's important rate of climb i become airborne and i have to reach an altitude of 10 kilometers 
I can slowly go like a balloon and take about half a day or maybe two hours or I may be as fast as F22 and reach it in less than a minute. That's the rate of travel. This is the aircraft. It runs on the runway. Right? Takes off and on this angle theta it climbs, right? It climbs at a certain rate of certain meters per second and it reaches its final cruise altitude. This is extremely important for military aircraft because you don't have luxury to spend time at lower altitudes after being airborne otherwise you will be dominated by the enemy aircraft. You have to go to your cruising altitude or your ranges which are beyond otherwise the surface short reaction missiles will take you to. You have to climb fast. So rate of climbing is extremely important. This partially is dictated by engine design and partially by structures. But this becomes as an input, as I again said, because this is like a technology, it becomes an input to your flight mechanics calculations. Range, again, derived from engine, from fuel and structures performance, right? What fuel, what engine, what structure. But again, it becomes input in your flight mechanics. Endurance, related to do with aerodynamic, aerodynamic design, structures and engine again becomes input for your flight mechanics. So you see how this holds all these beautiful pieces of science together? These are the three important parts. And then atmosphere. Of course, you are not going to fly anywhere on the, on the very, very light atmosphere of Mars or not even on the dense atmosphere of Titan, no. The atmosphere is of course of Earth, but it is about to do with say, I am not going into extreme atmospheres like Antarctica or Arctic Arctic polar winds. Yeah. It's standard atmosphere means a standard gradual steady atmosphere without any extreme torrential behaviors observed where certain set of pressure temperature properties which are observed. And this is important because this also becomes an input to your basic flight envelope calculation. We have understood this flight envelopes and structures point where we have said there are certain limitations of your engine, of your structures because of which you cannot cross certain Lakshman Rekha, certain boundaries. And this flight envelope also has one important factoring in of the atmospheric parameters. So for flight mechanics person, the standard atmosphere is a basic first toolkit to calculate its parameters and performance and then for a different set of actual atmospheric conditions to tweak it to get the desired outcome numbers. So range, you may specify standard atmosphere is 12,000 kilometers. If you suddenly in encounter a continual changing terrains like where from Rajasthan you suddenly go to Himalayan ranges and then actually land on sea. Extreme change in temperature you would say range is affected by 5% fine. But under certain, so this is like subject to, qualified to, right? Or there is an offer, bumper offer 20% and then you have this star mark subject to these conditions. This star mark is exactly the standard atmosphere, right? So, but it's very important because it goes as an input in your calculations of range, loiter, endurance, rate of climb. So these are the four very, very basic set of definitions which come into play. And now having understood these basic definitions, we are going to look at actually the standard atmosphere to begin with. Here again we will look at a set of basic terms to start with and then we will move into the nitty gritties. Geometric altitude, absolute altitude, geopotential altitude, pressure altitude, temperature altitude, and density altitude. Okay. This is not something very confusing, by the way. Huh? These are just the broader terminologies which we are going to look purely from an objective exam point of view. Absolute altitude, you take the earth, right? And in the earth, this is the center. This is the surface. Since the center of earth is more or less a basic 
absolute frame of reference R0 plus H is your absolute altitude. Reason being, Earth is not a perfect sphere, so R may slightly vary, right? We know in, in the polar regions it is slightly truncated, twisted, and in the and in actually the equatorial region it is slightly bulged, right? It's like an orange. We have always learned this in our basic geography. So that R0 from center plus the height from surface. So that I don't have to specify whether H at Antarctica is different from America. I don't care. Maybe in, in an equatorial region R will go up, in polar it may go down. But since center of Earth is my frame of reference, this is absolute, extreme absolute. Okay? So that's the absolute altitude. If G0 is the gravitational acceleration on the surface at a mean sea level, which is again defined in the world because given water is a single fluid object, it cannot have multiple mean levels, right? It has to be one. Above and below is different, right? So that mean level of the liquid, the fluid level is mean sea level and that's where you say G0. Then G, as we have learned in our space flight, is G0 R by H A square, which is G0 R upon R plus H square. So this is where the absolute attitude comes in. This is the radius. So this is the behavior of gravity with respect to this H. And R also. Which means it specifies where in the world you stand and then how up in the sky at that place you stand to define your relative G. Why? Because G is going to come into your weight and it is going to affect your range of trend on performance. So see, this is related implicitly to some set of constants or parameters which become part of your calculations. That's why this analysis is important. So we have understood absolute. Once we know absolute altitude, let's look at the next part which is talking about a set of other altitudes. Let's look at geometric altitude. Right? Geometric altitude is nothing but it is simple, which is a normal altitude which is from the height of the earth. Vertical distance. I'm writing some English words first, which are used to define mean. We have understood this, right? This altitude is extremely simple. From a mean sea level, which is again almost similar in the world, how up my aircraft is. I don't care now about its location. It is simply this, which gets fed in as a basic input. Right? Because surface may be anything. On Mount Everest, even if I'm one kilometer up, actually from mean sea level I'm nine plus kilometers up. Right? So this is a geometric altitude. Right? For that particular geographical terrain, when I'm standing above the surface, how much up? How up is it? That's the answer. So vertical distance, which means I may be anywhere, I have to take the absolute vertical from the mean sea level at the point, that is HE. Okay? So these two are very basic terms. The absolute altitude, which feeds in the geometric altitude, and it gives you the answer. Okay? Geopotential is a fixatious term. Geopotential altitude is a very, very interesting concept, and it is defined as imaginary altitude measured through mean sea level and calibrated by keeping G constant. <sighs> what does this mean? See, as you go up, there are two things which are going to happen. One, if you, R is also changing because of location change, G is changing. Second, with H, G decreases. So G actually, though even though very small, is going to vary with H. At an aircraft which flies at 10 kilometers, negligible variation is there. But at 300 kilometers for a space flight, it is substantial variation. So H, the geometric altitude H A, is implicitly a variable relation with G, with this relation, right? For geopotential, fixatiously to fix, you keep G constant. Hmm? Which means, what you do, G naught upon G dh by dh g, the geometric altitude, is equal to 1. Hydrostatic equation, 
GDH by keeping different altitude, difference constant is G0 into DH, right? Hydrostatics. Substituting DH from this equation, which is R square upon R plus HG square into DHG, what you get is H Is this clear? See, this is nothing but some basic mathematical manipulation. What we have done is in hydrostatics we know that for relative equilibrium of barometer you need to have G calibrated. Right? So dH upon G which is the height variation is simply dHg right? because for geometric altitude you know this variation. I can substitute this as Hg so that your confusion is gone. Geometric altitude dHg into G is by keeping G0 constant dH. So if I increment in my geometric altitude by dHg equivalently in my geopotential altitude I am incrementing by dH. And how much is it is the answer which I am finding. What did I do is simply, since G itself is a function of Hg, I use this equation to substitute and find out dGh in terms of G0, right? Which is easy, because what you have done is G0, R plus R square, so this is minus 3, so R square upon Hs square. You substituted this further equation, G0 dH is equal to G dH. Then you got dH as dHg which is on the right hand side R square upon R plus Hg whole square. You integrated this dH upon R plus X square and here it is H. You substituted the infinity boundary conditions that when G is equal to 0 what you get is simply 0 as H. Right? It has to be on surface there cannot be any variation. So you substituted that base condition from which R and R got cancelled out. So you get finally one R left out, R upon R plus Hg into Hg. So if you see, that implicitly means H is going to be always less than Hg. So geopotential altitude is always less than geometric altitude. You are one objective question for sure. We mathematically analyzed it. Physics point of view very simply, since G is itself decreasing, to keep G constant, I will need to reduce my altitude. Right? Simple. Mathematical correction. To keep something constant, if this quantity is decreasing, I have to decrease this proportionately. So H has to be always less than Hg. Right? So this is a very simple basic derivation of geopotential and geometric altitude. Now we have to look at what is pressure altitude, temperature altitude and density altitude. Once we look at that, we will use these set of equations to also identify a basic nomenclatures of aircraft performance where we will look at an aircraft, see its different orientations and give a set of basic taxonomy. That will close our part 1 of basic notations and equations and understanding of atmosphere and then we will move on to equations of motion.